This morning, we're going to continue our series in marriage and family. We took a break last week, and we're going to dive back into it. Over the course of the last several months, we've been looking at Scripture on what it teaches about marriage, about family, about parenting, all sorts of stuff. We began by contrasting between what culture teaches on men, women, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, children, dating, marriage, what culture teaches, contrasted that with what the Bible teaches. A few weeks ago, I looked at the book of Proverbs on what Solomon taught about how to avoid sexual sin and staying pure because the cost and destruction that sexual sin causes to our families and relationships is tremendous. Solomon was a pretty smart guy. In fact, the Bible declares that he, there was none that was as wise as Solomon before him or after him in the entire world. He was brilliant. He built an empire. He was wealthy. He built God a temple. He had all the pleasures that the world could offer him. In fact, the Bible says that he had 700 wives, 300 mistresses. By default, that meant that he had at least 1,700 women in his life telling him how to live, what to eat, how to behave, what to wear. 700 wives, 300 mistresses, 700 mother-in-laws. That's a lot of women in his life. No wonder he became a wise man, right? Um, Socrates said, um, if you get a good wife, you will be happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. If you get 700 wives, you'll probably become the greatest philosopher the world has ever known. Um, well, at the end of Solomon's life, he was able to look back and reflect on the choices that he made. And he began penning some thoughts down and they became known as we, what we call Proverbs, just small bits of insight, of wisdom and truth to encourage us in our walk. And he also wrote two other books. He wrote a love story called The Song of Solomon, a love story for a wife, that he, one of his wives that he married. Another book that he wrote is a book called Ecclesiastes, fascinating book, which I highly encourage you to read. Um, it talks about how he pursues wealth and fame and women and all sorts of stuff, and he finds none of these things satisfying, none of these things enjoyable, and ultimately, he says that all of these things are meaningless. This man learned his lesson, and he had some very important things to say to men, women, husbands, fathers, wives, mothers. Many of the lessons he learned, he learned because of the wisdom that God gave him. Others he learned because of the mistakes that he made and the choices that he made in trying to find joy and happiness in women and sex. So I thought this morning it would be wise to glean from Solomon's life and teaching and see what he would have to say to us as men, women, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers. What would this wise man, married this many women, what would he have to say to us? So I began looking at the book of Proverbs, studying it, and I ended up with about 16 to 17 points. And since I figured that since today was the opening day of the NFL, um, none of you guys wanted to sit around till 3 o'clock listening to me. Um, I know there was a game on Thursday, but Solomon said it wisely. That, too, was meaningless. Um, so I'm going to break these thoughts down over the next several weeks. I'm going to take about um, three weeks and look at Proverbs and just examine what Solomon teaches. I have about eight things to say for men, eight things to say for women. Initially, my thoughts were to spend about two weeks on men and two weeks on women. But then I realized that the, the first two weeks, the women would be extremely happy with me because I was beating up on the men. Um, and then the men would hate me. And then the last two weeks, the men would love me because I was beating up on the women, and the women would hate me. Um, and so I decided to I just make you all hate me at once. So I'm going to give you two to three points on men today and two to three points on women today and just challenge you guys. Those of you guys who are married, I want you to examine your life. Don't just sit there and nudge your wife and say, he's talking to you. That's not the point of this. Um, wives, don't do that to your husbands as well. He knows he's a mess up. He knows he's got faults. He, um, you don't need to remind him every day. Um, those of you who are single, I'm going to challenge you. There are two things that um, are going to be directed at you. Are you doing these things in your life? There are two things that are going to be about the opposite sex, things that you need to be looking for in the person that God is going to bring into your life. So listen to every point, examine it, and apply it to your life. As I begin, let me say this. We're living in an age where there's a cultural war. Marriage will be redefined by our culture if it hasn't been already. It will be. In fact, one of the platforms for this election is how to redefine marriage. I don't want us to be a church that speaks about what we're against. 
We know what, what the Bible teaches, and we stand for what the truths of the scriptures teach. But I don't want us to be known for, hey, we're a church that's anti this or anti that. I want to challenge you guys over the next three weeks to be a church that models what marriage is supposed to look like. To be a parent that God desires. That when the world sees you, they don't say you're anti this, but they see your love for your wife. They see your love for your husband. They see how you raise your children, and they say, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to be a parent like that. I want to be a husband like that. I want to be a wife like that. I want to be um, in a relationship like that. I want us to be known for what we are instead of what we're against. So let me encourage you. As I teach these things, it's not simply so I get the joy of beating you up over the next three weeks. But as you apply these truths to your life, your marriage and your relationships and your life would be transformed because there's a world that's looking for good role models. There's a world that's looking for what does marriage look like in a world where there are more divorces now happening than ever before. People are asking, is it even worth getting married? And they should look at us and say, yes, because there's a beautiful marriage. Husbands love their wives. Wives love their husbands. Children are proud of their parents. And they should look at us and see what God intended for marriage. So let me begin by picking on you men first. Men, number one, you are called to be leaders of instruction in the home. Leaders of instruction. Proverbs 4, verse 1 says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. And be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. The first nine chapters of Proverbs is Solomon speaking to his son, his sons, his daughters. If you want a mental picture, imagine a man sitting in the living room by a fireplace and his kids are around him and he's just teaching them everything he knows. He's gleaning the wisdom that he's learned over the years and instructing his kids on how to live. He repeats this idea of a father instructing his son over a dozen times. A dozen times in the first nine chapters you'll see, my son, pay attention. Son, listen to me, take heed. Focus. This is important. You need to listen to this. The point of this is it's assumed throughout the book of Proverbs, throughout the Bible, it's assumed that the husband, the father, the man is to take the role of being the spiritual leader in the home. He is to be the one that disciples his family. Guys, you need to understand this. Being a spiritual leader doesn't happen by simply bringing your family to church every Sunday. Being a spiritual leader doesn't happen by you just showing up at your community group. Being a spiritual leader doesn't happen by you just going to a conference and learning seven steps on being a good dad or being a good husband. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen by default. You have to work at it. It takes effort. It takes time. This summer, over this course of this year, I've been involved in about 10 weddings. It's been an insane year for weddings. Everyone wants to get married. Most, many of them, I've had the privilege of officiating and pronouncing the couple as husband and wife. However, it's not the moment that the husband and wife is standing before me where I pronounce them as husband and wife, that God miraculously saps them and the man becomes a super husband and the wife becomes a super wife. Nothing magical happens at the altar. Nothing supernatural happens. The same sinner that woke up that morning alone is the same sinner that's now walking down the aisle with someone holding his or her hand. They're still sinners. They still are messed up. Nothing changed at the altar internally. You need to work at being a good husband. You need to work at being a good dad. You need to work at being a good man. It takes work. That means you you guys... You need to connect with other men that are further along with you. This is discipleship. This is learning and gleaning from other people. You single guys, you spend time with married folks and you learn from them. That means finding someone who's been married longer than you. It could be one year, two years, five, five, 10, 20 years. They may be younger than you. Age doesn't matter. Their experience in life matters. You need to be meeting with them, asking them questions, gaining wisdom. I can tell you that I am, 
what I am as a husband and a father is because of the men that are in my life to challenge me to be more like Jesus. They create an environment where I can share my struggles with my marriage. Trying to raise a seven-year-old that's fascinated with Justin Bieber, and I don't know what to do with it. Trying to raise a five-year-old that wants to beat up his sister every waking moment. These guys don't have all the answers for me, but they encourage me, they pray for me, and offer me whatever godly counsel they can give for me. One of the things I do when we do premarital counsel and counseling is on the first session, I tell them, hey, over the next several weeks, I want you to start writing a list of questions. It can be about life, it can be about marriage, it can be about children, it can be about finances, it can be about sex, it can be about anything. Start writing these questions down. Session, session number six, me and my wife are going to have dinner with you guys, and you guys are allowed to pick our brains on anything. You can ask any questions you want, you can pick our brains, you can just um, ask anything. We'll, we'll honestly share with you. Now, we don't know everything, but we've been married nine years. We've got two kids, and we deal with crazy people. I mean, godly saints every Sunday. Um, and we've, we've learned a lot over the last nine years. It's easy for me to tell the difference between those who think marriage is easy and they already know all the answers to all the questions that they are going to be confronted with and those who realize that they're about to enter into something that's going to completely drastically change their lives. It's easy to tell because of the amount of questions that they bring in. Those who think that they've got it all together, they come in, they get a free meal, and they go home. Those who are realize that their life is about to be changed, they're going to be, they've got a million questions. I had one couple, they had like 50-some questions, and we're like, yeah, you get an hour. Um, and so, um, but they had a million questions. They wanted to learn. They wanted to grow. It's also interesting to check up on them a few months later into their marriage. Usually the ones that find their marriage difficult are the ones that presume that they knew all the answers before they got married. This takes a lot of work. To be a spiritual leader at the home means you've got to be meeting with other people, other men that are further along with you to gain wisdom. You older folks, you've been married for a while. Invest into our single guys. Invest into those who've just newly been married. Pour into them. Give them wisdom. They don't know how to properly communicate. They don't know how to resolve conflict. Give them wisdom. Be open. Be transparent. Pour into their lives. In the book of Proverbs, we find that this is shepherding. Leading in the home of the wise and loving husband is done so in a very practical and integrated way. What does leading in the home look like? What does it look like in the context of your home? It means you take your family and you teach them. Not just when you sit down with them at Bible study, but you pour into them into the teachable moments of life. You look at Proverbs and this is what you see. Solomon's walking down with his son down the street and he sees a woman that's engaged in adultery and he says, hey, do you see her? Do you see what she's doing? Don't get engaged with her. Stay away from her. Avoid her. Do you see that man that's cheating on his wife to go sleep with this girl? Don't be like that. He's taking the teachable moments of life. As he's going through the motions of life, he sees things where he can say, son, listen, here's something important that I want you to learn. Do you see what that's going on right there? Here's, let me teach you something about this. Let me show you what you need to do. Look at this guy. Watch how he responds to her. Look at what he's doing. Did you see what he did? Let me instruct you about this. This is dangerous. Here's why. Be careful. Watch yourself. They're living their everyday lives and using the teachable moments of life to instruct their children and their family to follow God. It's a teachable moments of life. This is how leadership is taking place in the home. It's in the teachable moments. This is the way you lead. You lead by going through life with your family and learning from the experiences of life. Let me give you an example. The other day, Tim came home from school and he said that this kid was mean to him at daycare and told him that he sucks. Now, as a father, my initial instinct was to tell him, well, call him an even worse name, right? I mean, call him and say, you're the suckiest or something like that. Or teach him how to punch. Because who wants a five-year-old to come home upset that another kid called him a name? But you use those moments. I pulled him aside. I say, hey, think about this. Is everyone in the world going to like you? No. What happened to Jesus? Was he a good guy? He was. Did he do anything wrong? No. What happened to him? People hated him. He died. I could have used my opportunity to teach him how to be self-defensive, 
Or I could use the opportunity to teach him the truth of the gospel. Hey, not everyone's going to like you. But what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. Tim, tomorrow when you go, be nice to him. Be an example of Jesus. Five-year-old. He's learning. He's growing. If the bully continues to bully him, I'll get involved. That's my role as a dad. But I get these opportunities, teaching moments, to say, hey, be like Jesus. Oftentimes, we're so busy in the routines of life. Notice, even in our discipline of our children, we want to discipline our children simply to make them do what we tell them to do. But these are opportunities to point them toward Jesus, teach them the truths of the gospel. To be a good teacher means that you have to use your creativity, imagination to instruct and teach them. And use the situation that life brings to them to do that. Ask God to open your eyes to do these things. When you sit down with your kids and teach them a Bible story, don't be boring to them. Don't simply read a passage and be done. Make the story creative. The other day we were doing a story of uh, the Israelites walking around the tower of um, the city of Jericho. I had Tim pretend to be a Je- the tower and Nicole walk around her walk around him to illustrate the story, make them engage, make them learn. You guys who are single, be creative in your growth, in your growing with God. Don't just simply read a passage and say, I did my spiritual duty. Find a good book that will challenge you to grow. Those of you who are married and don't have kids, be creative in your growth, in your walking with God. Find a good resource that you could use to grow. Ask questions on the passage. Be the leaders of instruction in the home. Second thing, guys, guys, you are to be leaders of the work ethic in the home. You are to be leaders of work work ethic. One of the things that are reiterated over and over in the book of Proverbs is the need to be diligent and the need to work hard. It's one of the things he wants to make sure his son understands. Work hard. Be the man in the home. Provide for the family. Take care of the children. Be responsible. One of the illustrations that he gives in Proverbs, in Proverbs 6, is when he talks about an ant. He says, in Proverbs 6, he says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways. Be wise. Doesn't have a chief, officer, or ruler. She prepares her bread in summer, gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want you like an armed man. What's he talking about? It's very simple. He's telling his son, look, when you're a man, in fact, even now, when it's a little boy, you can't procrastinate. You can't waste your life. You can't waste time. Guys, do you realize that procrastination is sin? It's a sin to waste time, to waste time that God has given you and not do anything with it and to burn it and not use it wisely is a sin. God has given you every breath that you have. And to waste it, because you're wasting a gift that he's given you. His point here is that you need to grow up. Some of you guys need to grow up. Some of you need to stop wasting your time. Some of you need to stop entertaining yourself to death. People are dying without Jesus. People need discipling around you. Your wife is toiling and laboring to make sure the house is in order, dinner's on the table, kids are taken care of, and you're sitting on the couch playing video games or watching the game. Your kids are growing up, and pretty soon they will be gone, and you'll wonder where the time went and realize that you wasted the opportunities to play with them, invest in your kids, love on your kids. You wasted it because you were more interested in trying to get the highest score on whatever game you were trying to play, whatever game you were watching, whatever important email you were sending, and your kids will be gone. And they'll say, my dad was never a dad because he was too busy. You entertain yourself to death, and you're wasting so much time that God has given you where you could use it for your profit. Invest in your family. Don't waste it. There'll come a day where you as a husband will not be able to spend the time with your kids with your wife as well as you can right now. The time will pass very soon. Listen, when you die, no one will care how many ball games you attended. No one will care how many levels you were able to beat on whatever game you were playing. No one will care how many Facebook friends you have, 
No one will care how many films you watched. No one will care how many books you read. No one will give a rip about how much theology you know. No one will care what kind of phone or computer you own, what kind of car you drive, or how many square feet your house is. No one will care. None of that is going to matter when you die. What's going to matter is what investment did you make into the lives of the people that God has brought into your life, into your wife, into your kids, into your church, into your family, into your friendships. Where did you invest your time? That's what's going to matter. Those are the people that are going to stand at your funeral and talk about you. Some of you guys are entertaining yourself to death. You need to think, you need to have a plan, and you need to pursue it. Otherwise, you'll just be going in circles. I counseled a guy recently that's been unemployed for a while. His wife is frustrated because he won't put out resumes. He won't go online and check for jobs. Just sits at home and watches TV all day while she provides all the income for the home. It will destroy your home. You single guys, you guys should be planning now for how you're going to provide for a wife and provide for her children. Yeah, you're thinking, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pay for lunch after church. I understand. But you are, how are you focusing on your school right now and education right now? How are you choosing how you handle your credit cards right now and your debt right now? How are you choosing your careers and vocation that will put you into a place where one day you can provide for the spouse that God blesses you with, the children that God blesses you with, or you're going to enter into a relationship where you're going to be burdened because you did not handle your life properly now. Now's the time where you can make the most of the time that God has given you. What choices are you making today that affects your tomorrow? Staying up all night to play video games and barely passing college and not being able to get a job and living in your parents' house till you're 30 is not being wise with the time that God has given you. Be wise on how you use your time. Start thinking about your future. How can I prepare for when God brings me a spouse? How can I prepare for when God blesses me with children? What can I do now with my life so that when God opens a door for me, I'm ready? Don't waste your life. All right, ladies. Two things for you. I'm going to be honest. Solomon is not nice to women at all. He is not nice to you ladies at all. You can't blame the guy. There are many wives, many mother-in-laws. He became bitter. Most of the example that Solomon uses in the book of Proverbs are negative ones of things that you should not do. Number one, Proverbs 2.16. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsake the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. The first thing that Solomon tells women is that you are supposed to be models of faithfulness. Models of faithfulness. Listen, marriage is a covenant. It's not a contract. You guys know the difference between the two, right? A contract is something that can be broken if one party does not keep their end of the bargain. For example, if you guys ever decide, ever decide to hire me and pay me, I'd enter into a contract for a relationship with the church. There will be certain expectations that are placed on me. Lead the church, cast vision, prepare messages, visit the sick. If I came in week in and week out and said, oh, God told me that we shouldn't preach today and just do worship, and I do that because of my laziness and because I didn't want to prepare and invest into preparing a message, Eventually, the contract will be broken. I will be fired looking for another job. A contract is based on two people meeting their expectations. But a covenant is not like that. A covenant is completely different. It's the most serious means of making a promise between God and man. So in a marriage covenant, it's not just a promise between two individuals. It's not a husband and a wife. God's involved. He's involved in the covenant. It is before God that you are making this promise. It's a holy promise, a personal commitment that cannot be broken by the winds of adversity. You don't play around with it. You don't break the covenant that God gave you. It's very, very important. And even though the world, we see stories of men that are cheating on their wives more than women, it's not, it's not untrue that women are not cheating as well, especially among the church folks. Stats say that one out of every three men one out of every four women cheat on their spouse. Ladies, don't underestimate the power 
that you have in your family. I heard a story of a guy who worked hard, providing for his family, loved Jesus, uh, working so that his wife could stay at home, take care of the children, doing everything possible so this wife could be at home. While she was home all day, she got bored and felt lonely and developed a relationship with a guy online. He wowed her with his poetry, wrote songs for her, and she ended up leaving her husband, taking her kids, and running off to another, another state. They went to court, they divorced, the court gave the kids to the mom because they usually do that by default. The guy every night will not go out because he wants to make sure he's at home by nine o'clock, loves Jesus, works hard. He's home by nine o'clock every night, sits by the phone so he can get a call from his five-year-old daughter so that he could pray with her. The power that you have over your family. Listen, I understand, those of you guys who've been married for a while, I understand that the romance that you had with your spouse in the early years or the dating years have gone down significantly since you've been married. He doesn't surprise you with flowers anymore. He doesn't wow you anymore, especially now if there are kids in the picture. Yes, I understand that we guys stink at being romantic. We can't remember birthdays. We can't remember our anniversary. We can't remember where or when we had our first date. We don't remember those details that you guys remember. I know that we don't notice if you got a haircut or did something different with your body. We often miss those things. We need to work on that, and we do. Guys, we need to work on that. However, marriage isn't simply about a feeling of being in love. It's a lifelong commitment before God that we will spend the rest of our lives together for better, for worse, in good times, in bad times, in riches, in poverty, in sickness, in health. You newlyweds that are all over each other in love right now, I guarantee you soon, if it hasn't happened already, you will wake up one morning, look over at your spouse and wonder, why in the world did I marry him? Why in the world did I marry her? It will happen. You'll wonder, why? And the answer isn't because she's dashing, because he's intelligent, because she makes me feel special, because he knows all the right words to say. The answer is because God in his sovereignty chose to bless you with someone that will love you for who you are. You know yourself better than anyone else does. And this guy or this girl chose to commit the rest of his life with you. God be praised. You, the worst of sinners, God chose to send someone to you. When you say, I don't want that, you're saying that God does not know what he's doing. God blessed you with him. God blessed you with her. And you choose to say at that point that God, yeah, marriage is rocky. Things aren't always smooth. It's not as romantic as it used to be. But I'm going to give my 100% to my husband. I'm going to give my 100% to my spouse. Any guy out there can wow me with my words, with his words, flowers, and flashy things. One guy chose to say that he will spend the rest of his life with me. One woman chose to say she will spend the rest of her life with me. He's willing to stay by my side for the rest of my life. See, I don't know if you understand this, but the Bible's definition of marital love is incredible. Our example is Jesus. And the Bible says that Christ, while we were yet sinners, came, died for us, and he now calls us his bride. And I can't, I don't know about you, but my life, there are many, many times where if I was Jesus, I would have ditched, it, ditched me a long, long time ago. But he doesn't. He keeps his covenant. He's with me till the end. The Bible says he'll never leave me, never forsake me, always with me till the very end. This is what marriage covenant is. This is what the world is looking for. In the good times, in the bad times, people that will stick together, commit to their relationship no matter what. Number two, women, you are called to be women, models of silence and wisdom. Models of silence and wisdom. They always go together. Hear me out. One of the things that you want to be known for is being wise and being quiet not boisterous, not foolish. You don't want that. Proverbs 9, 13. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. Women who speak their mind usually have to have the last word. They also usually have, usually all their friends first as well. I want to have all of their friends listening to them all the time. You've seen that, right? You go to a party or 
a community group and there's this one person that's talking over and over and over. They won't let anyone else speak. They talk the whole time. They have an opinion on everything. They're bad mouthing people. Eventually you see women just slipping away, slipping away. And there's one person stuck, poor woman that can't get away. She's stuck listening to this person. And this person is still just jabbering over and over and over. You know what it's like. They keep losing friends. The person who's just noisy just keeps talking. Eventually her husband shuts down. I've seen this in marriages. One comes to mind right now. The husband basically shuts down. Great guy, loves God, but the wife is overbearing, won't let him speak, keeps putting him down in front of others, questions every decision that he makes. Eventually he shuts down. He gives up. And how he just lives, just goes through the motions, just exists in the home. She does all the talking. He sits there, does nothing. You guys have seen families like that. So you guys need to be careful. Those of you guys who choose, you're looking for a wife. You need to choose a wife that loves Jesus and is wise and chooses her words carefully. The Bible refers to a tongue as a double-edged sword for a major purpose. The tongue is the human body's most damaging weapon. I've seen churches destroyed because of the tongue. Marriage is destroyed because of the tongue. In a single word, you can damage your testimony for Jesus, not just temporarily, but for the rest of your life. You know, Peter, in the New Testament, makes a powerful statement in his writing and encourages women in his First Peter 3. He says, women, don't let your adorning be the, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Notice, God values a quiet spirit in a woman. He values this. What does this mean? Does this mean a woman should never say anything? That she should always be quiet? No, that's not what he's saying. It's, but he's saying that a woman should not have an argumentative, contentious spirit. She should not be someone that's quick to argue and demand her way. You should be peaceable to others, respectful of your husband. There are several scriptures in the book of Proverbs, we'll look at this in the next several weeks, where you see women that are angry and contentious, and one, right, one proverb says that woman is so contentious that the husband just wants to sleep on the roof because he wants to avoid her. Don't be like that. See, there's a certain attitude among some women that has its roots in, its fem in the feminist movement, and it's still prevalent in society today. This attitude is a deep anger toward men. They want to prove that they're just as good as their male counterparts and that they don't even need them. And contrast that with the attitude of a gentle, quiet spirit that God values in women. A truly beautiful woman is not in competition with men. She understands her value, her strengths, and she understands the value and the strength that the man possesses, and she appreciates them. When men and women both possess certain qualities that are needed by one another. When a woman has a gentle and a quiet spirit, she's attractive to others, she's attractive to God. There's a book called What Men Want, and the author writes, women are astonished when we tell them what many professional men look for in a woman on a first date, besides chemistry, of course. Are you ready to hear what women hope to find in a woman, what men hope to find in a woman that they're dating on their first date? Men like women who are nice. Men are suckers for kindness and consideration. We love women who are flexible, easygoing. Most women cannot resist a sweet woman. Women who are gracious, kind, are attractive. Not just to God, but to men. Let me say this, and I will remind you of this over the next several weeks. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that you're going to meet a spouse that's going to meet all of these requirements. You're not. Whether you're single and looking for a spouse or you are already married, your spouse will not meet these requirements. Your future spouse is not going to meet these requirements. What you're looking for when you look for this in a spouse is you're looking for a functional savior. To make them into a functional savior who will deliver you from insignificance, deliver you from a lack of respect, deliver you from whatever love you never got when you were growing up, deliver you from loneliness, deliver you from lack of pleasure, whatever element you want to throw in there. If you think that you will find someone who will save you from all of these things, you're wrong. No man is going to be able to do that. No woman is ever going to be able to do that. It will never work. You will destroy them or you will destroy yourself. You will crush them by putting, them, putting on them a weight that they cannot be, 
that they cannot bear, to be your savior and to transform your life and to deliver you. They can't do that. Or you will crush yourself by being a savior for them. Your spouse, your children, your future spouse is not your savior. There is a savior that you need, and that is Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, he still needs to be your significance. His name is Jesus, and he is where you find your ultimate joy, your ultimate satisfaction, your ultimate companionship. All of those things are found in him and only in him. Jesus is not just our leader, guys. He's not just your model woman, but he is also your redeemer. This is your greatest treasure. This is where your greatest joy is. Jesus is more attractive. He is of more worth. He is of more joy. He is more precious than any person out there in this world, including your spouse. Here's why. Because he exchanged his beauty and his glory for horror. He gave his beauty up for ashes. Isaiah 53 says that God had no beauty in him that we would desire him. If there was any beauty in the world, it should be reflected in Jesus. But on the cross, he gave up all of his beauty. He gave up all of his splendor. They beat him, they abused him, and they looked on him, and the Bible says that we would turn our faces from him because he was so disgusting. And he gave all of that up. You hide your faces from a mangled savior who was beaten dead for you, crucified for you, gave up everything to draw you in so that you can make you beautiful. He can make you a child of God. He can make you perfect. He can make you forgiven. He can make you accepted. He can make you loved. All of those things that you're trying to find in another guy or another woman, none of those things, none of those things that we will ever satisfy you. Jesus says, I can do all of that on the cross. See, you will have to be overwhelmed by that beauty with the beauty of, of him, overwhelmed with the image of the bloodied Savior hanging on the cross who died for your sin. When that is beautiful for you, here's what begins to happen. Your spouse will be put in the right position. Your children will be put in the right position. Your boyfriend or your girlfriend will be put in the right position. They won't be your Savior anymore. They're not the ones who's going to deliver you from loneliness or whatever need you have in your life. But Jesus will be your savior. He will be your God. He will be your redeemer. He will change your life. And then you will able to be able to love, to cherish, to care for, to submit, all those things to your spouse because Jesus is your ultimate joy. Jesus is your ultimate satisfaction. And if your spouse fails you, which he will, which she will, will, it's okay. Because if your joy is in your spouse, you'll be disappointed. But when you find your joy in Jesus, when you find your delight in Jesus, even when people close to you fail you, you'll be all right. Because you know that you have found acceptance, you have found forgiveness, you have found love in someone who will never change. He's always the same yesterday, today, forever. People fail, but Jesus never fails. This is what I'm going to challenge you over the next three weeks. I'm going to call you men to be men. I'm going to call you women to be women. But at the end of it, I'm going to call you not to look at yourself to say that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to call you to Jesus to say, Jesus, would you be my joy? Would you be my satisfaction? Would you be my treasure? so that I will be everything you're calling me to be. You can't do this on your own. You husbands, you can't be the perfect wife. You fail, you mess up. You wives, you can't be the perfect wife. But by God's grace and his help, you can be everything God has called you to be. And when you aren't, you can be, you can be quick to say, hey, forgive me, help me. And you can come with an attitude of Jesus, meekness, kindness, and have a marriage that brings glory and honor to him. The world is looking. They're watching. This morning, as we come to the table, I don't want you to come and say, I've got so much to work on. I've got so much to fix. But would you come to the table this morning and saying, God, you found me in my weakest point. You found me when I had nothing going right. And you love me anyway. 
and your love for me wasn't based on how I perform or how well I do. Your love for me is unconditional. You will never break that covenant. You will never break that promise. You will always be true. And as you come to the table and grab the elements, would you remind yourself of the Savior's great love for you? And would you also remind yourself that you are not in this life alone, that he's with you every step of the way. In your marriages, he's there to guide you. In your relationships, he's there to help you. In your parenting, he's there to give you wisdom. You are not alone. This table reminds us of the great work that Christ has done for us to save us, but it also reminds us that he is with us so that we can live our lives now for his glory. Father, as we come this morning to the table, we confess that we are not perfect. These things that you require of us in and of ourselves, we're never able to do. We're selfish. We're proud. We're self-centered. We only care about ourselves, and we often forget about the people that you place around us. But by your help, we can change. And our hope is not in ourselves, but our hope is in you. And we thank you that Jesus believed in us and was willing to die for us and then send his Holy Spirit to live inside of us so that we can change. So this morning we come to the table an act of submission, an act of worship, and an act of recognizing that you are so good, that we are such great sinners, but you are such a great savior. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.